My name is Jim, Jim Dowling. I'm CEO at Hopsworks, and uh, I'm going to introduce this webinar today. It's not really a webinar. It's a new series we call LLM Makers because there won't be any slides. We're going to go into code and we're going to look at the paradigm called function calling with large language models. Now, function calling is, a, is not a really new paradigm. Uh, you can go back uh, about 10 months, 11 months when uh, OpenAI introduced function calling as a capability in GPT-4, um, but it's taken quite a while to take, uh, take off. So what I'm going to talk about today is I'll introduce function calling, but I'm going to go through an, an application we built um, where we use function calling to call a machine learning model. So a bit meta, we're using AI to call AI, but also to call historical data. So we're going to use that from a feature store. And that's structured data from a table. So we're going to do RAG without a vector database, if that sounds interesting. So um, there is a link uh, for in the chat uh, Mariana put in there. You can have a look uh, at that. So first of all, what is function calling and why is it interesting? I think function calling is interesting primarily because it opens up structured data, a lot of enterprise data, to use in large language models. So right now, there's a lot of excitement about using unstructured data in vector databases, taking a user's prompt and using that to look up relevant text or related text, and we use uh, the term similar text, and that really means really cosine similarity of the, your text with the text that's indexed in the vector database, and using that to augment your prompt. But that doesn't really help you get at a lot of the enterprise data that's in tabular format, so in structured data in data warehouses, databases, data lakes, and but also other sources of data, maybe third-party data that you can access via an API. I'm going to look at a model today, how we can call a model from uh, from within our large language model. And um, that's what we're going to do today. We're going to look at this in the context of an air quality example. So let's get started. What is function calling with LLMs? Well, it really refers to as the ability of an LLM to take a user prompt and impute the correct function to execute from a set of available functions, and then to also pass in the correct parameters to that function. Now, that sounds quite complex, but basically you're going to type in some text, a, a question, and the large language model is going to return JSON. So it's not going to return a function. It's not going to execute the function for you. It's going to return JSON. And you're going to use that JSON then to execute the function. I'm going to use Python today. So we can take a JSON uh, returned in Python. And we can actually then invoke a function from that JSON. It's pretty straightforward to do in Python. Now, this is a definition from the Hopsworks website. But if you go to uh, OpenAI, they have a, a large section here on function calling. And you can see that it's pretty similar. They talk about returning a model will generate JSON for you, and you can use that JSON to call a function from your code. And they also highlight that there are some risks, of course, because now if you're going to go outside the bounds of your large language model, um, you may call functions. And if you're giving users the ability to call functions, and those functions maybe access your internal data, there's a risk, of course, of uh, leaking that data out. Uh, unserved So you, you have to be very careful when you're thinking about what you're going to expose with the functions you're going to um, build into your large language model applications. So there's a, a bit more details here from OpenAI. They talk about what can you use function calling for. So they say, well, we can call external APIs. And that's interesting, get current weather. Um, I'm going to call a model, I'm not going to call a third party API today. And um, we can convert natural language into API calls. So you can see here, it's, it's, it looks like it's accessing your internal data, get customers with minimum revenue created before. So this looks like it's a function that will call a backend database. And that's what we're going to do today. We're going to do it with a feature store. Um, and this is a really good way of accessing data because there is a kind of a 90-10 rule for a lot of analytics and a lot of queries that 90% of the queries are for 10% of the, the functions or 10% of the data. So when we talk about air quality, people typically ask, what will the air quality be like this week or next week? Uh, they don't often ask, you know, what's the typical difference between a Tuesday and a Wednesday in terms of air quality? That would be a, an uncommon question to answer. So you maybe when you're doing function calling, you expose your models or your data with functions uh, related to queries that you think users will, be, will use at first. And then over time, we can augment them. Now we look at how to write these functions. Currently, it's kind of a 
a, a, a labor intensive process, but we look at how we're going to make that easier with metadata over time. And in particular, we'll look at the feature store and how, for example, a table in the feature store has metadata related to columns, names, descriptive names that you typically wouldn't associate with a, a table in a database. And that will help us in function calling um, in order to call the correct function and pass the right parameters to that function. And then finally, you can see it says extract structured uh, data from text. Yes, that's reasonably interesting. Now, the other point is not all machine learning models or LLMs will support function calling. They need to be fine-tuned to support function calling. And most of the GPT models now are fine-tuned to support function calling. And um, Google also have a, a model that supports fun, uh, fun, uh, function calling called Gemini Pro. <clears throat> it's quite a, quite a large model. So if we think about OpenAI and we think about Gemini Pro, these are hosted models. Uh, you have to pay to access them by, by an API. Uh, your data will leave uh, your organization and not every organization is super comfortable with it. They do work quite well. Um, we'll look at open APIs function calling later on, but we'll also look at uh, a, a variant or a fine tuned variant of Mistral called Hermes, uh, which will run inside our organization. So no data will leave our organization or our account. We will be able to do all of this inside a uh, private uh, data center or private cluster. Now, but uh, Google talk about function calling as well. So they've advertised that as a capability of their new Gemini models. Uh, they basically say you can, uh, you need to define a function name and its parameters and open a API compatible schema. We're going to use that as well. We we'll look at Hermes also uses it. Um, and then we need to have a description of the function and then we can go ahead and call them. And there's ex some examples down here for how to use them. Uh, but let's move on to look at um, Hermes. Hermes is an open source. It's based on an open source model, uh, Mistral 7 billion, and it's been fine-tuned. It's been fine-tuned specifically for function calling. So you can see here Hermes Pro Large Language Model to perform function calling based on a provided schema. There's a lot more details in here. I'm not going to go through all the details of Hermes, um, but it's uh, it's out there. And if you want to do function calling without having to go to the open internet, to open AI, or Gemini, um, then this is uh, an option for you. Um, Hermes, last week, a new version called Hermes 2 Pro came out, which is this one here. It's also the hugging face. Um, and it's we, we played around with it a bit during the week, and I thought that maybe I'll run this in the webinar. But in fact, we couldn't get it to work as well as the original Hermes, so I'm going to stick with the original Hermes. But we we'll, may update this tutorial that I'm going to go through today um, to work with Hermes 2 over time. Okay, so uh, let's move on. So we're going to look at these OpenAI, and we're going to look at Hermes, and we're going to look at function calling for both of those. And the application we're going to use to as context and the code we're going to do is based on predicting air quality. So this is actually a machine learning problem. Uh, I'm based in Stockholm, and this is the closest um, air quality sensor to our office in, in the south, southern part of the city. Uh, you can see that air quality is not that great today. This is not the best place for air quality in the city. Generally, it's quite good. And you can see some historical data over the air quality in the city. Um, but air quality is not uh, something that uh, you get predictions for. You can't get weather forecasts for air quality for your street in that many places globally at the moment. This is a really good website here where you can see all of this public data about air quality. Uh, but air quality is really localized. I can get a weather forecast for my city. Great. It will be valid for the whole city. But air quality is very localized. It's based on your street. And this particular website, which collects all of this data, um, it provides historical data, but it also provides uh, up-to-date data. Now, um, there are forecasts here, but I, I actually bought my own sensor and put it in over here. And the, those forecasts are not, uh, uh, they're bogus, to be honest, because it, it, it creates forecasts even before the sensor is connected. So the forecasts are not based on the actual data. They're based on some sort of pooled model over the city. But what we want is an actual forecast for this part of the city. So where do LLMs come in? Well, we're going to train a model, and the model is going to predict the air quality. It's going to take the historical data over the air quality. And we're going to use weather as a, uh, a feature to predict air quality. So we're going to look at the wind direction, how strong the wind is. We're going to look at the temperature. We're going to look at uh, precipitation. And those features will help predict air quality, and it works quite well. So this is the model. I'm not going to go through the, how the model was built, but you can see basically we have this model that's predicting air quality. Um, you can see a prediction for this location in Stockholm for the next week. 
<laughs> and in general, it looks pretty good. The air quality looks, it, it's approaching, you know, moderate, which is kind of unhealthy for some, but it's pretty good generally over the holiday weekend, which is nice. Uh, so that's what I, I want to get out of it. But and, and what I want to do with this model is I want to make it callable. So I want to make it available um, so that I can just say, hey, you know, what will the air quality be like next week or what will the air quality be like tomorrow? So just playing with it earlier, this was this is using the Hermes one. Um, and I, I, I speak into it and I say, OK, what's the air quality like tomorrow? And it gives me back an answer saying based on the air quality measurements tomorrow, March 29th. It's expected to be modern and high range. It's unhealthy for some. And this is nice, right? So this is a we're making the machine learning model that we've created a user accessible application. This is actually a Gradio application. Um, and this particular one is using the Hermes model. So that's what we're going to do. And I'm going to go through this from start to stop. We're not going to go too much into the air quality example. We don't if you want the the repo is publicly available. This is the repository here. Um, so if you see it, it's it's feature store book, MLS, MLFS book, and it's in chapter three. And it's one of the notebooks. You can see it in here. Now, where is this coming from? Well, currently I'm writing a book for O'Reilly. So if you go to the hopsworks.ai homepage, you'll see that this link here, download now, and the first chapter is available. It's called Building Machine Learning Systems uh, with a Feature Store. But you can see here that it's also related to not just batch in real time, but LLM systems. So there's an aspect in there. You can get the first chapter for free. You'll get some background about, about this. Uh, I would uh, have a look at it if you're interested. So this is the repository, and this is the code here. It's a bunch of notebooks with some Python programs. So it's all Python code. We're going to go through the, the Python code. You can see this is what we get out of it. We're going to get a prediction of air quality. But what we want to do is we want to personalize those air quality predictions with an LLM and make them user accessible. So we're going to use function calling as a paradigm. So let's zoom in a little bit if we can see our text. So this is an air quality forecasting system. We're augmenting with LLM capabilities, um, but we're not just going to augment it with future forecasting capabilities. That's going to use the model here, our machine learning model, but also historical questions. What was the air quality like last week or in February on the 10th of February? So what we need you typically in large language models, you consider this retrieval augmented generation or RAG. Um, we want to add to our prompt. So we, here we have an example of a user prompt. What will the air quality be? Will the air quality be OK for me this coming week? So uh, if you ask that question to a large language model that doesn't have any external data available to it, that has a cutoff date in its training, it doesn't know anything about where should I give you the air quality prediction for, what it will be like next week. It doesn't have access to that information. It was Its cutoff date for training was two years ago. Uh, it doesn't know anything about you, who you are. Um, so it's really impossible in the kind of traditional world of RAG where we go to a vector database and, and give you an answer. So we need to go beyond uh, vector databases and RAG to, to actually answer this question. So what we can do in this case is we our large language model will not just take in the text. It will be embedded inside an application. And this is true in general for most large language applications. They're going to have an application, and maybe a user will log in. Maybe the user will have an ID. Maybe you're in retail, and the user puts a booking ID in there. So we have some way of identifying you or the context or where you are. So some of the information that we might want to get, for example, your location, maybe the application can provide it. If you're on a web page, you can it can ask you, can I uh, uh, access your location? And you might say yes. And today's date, we can get that from the application itself. It can just call a function to say, what is the current time? Um, but then we have another piece of external information we need, the predicted air quality. Now, if there was a REST service available on the internet, I might make a call on the internet to that REST service and say, what's the forecast air quality for this time range? And I get an answer. But given that that's not available as a service in the internet, and I've trained a model to predict it, I'm going to call that model from within my application. The other thing I might want to do is ask a question about historical air quality. What was the air quality like last week uh, or a month ago? Um, that data we're storing in the feature store. So when we trained our machine learning model, we stored all of this historical data about air quality and weather data. And now we can query it. And we can create directly from our application with a function. And then finally, you might have some personalized data. I haven't done this yet, so this is homework to do. Um, about the user, maybe we have, am I in the sensitive group or not? So I have two kids who are in a sensitive group. They have uh, something called cystic fibrosis. 
air quality has to be good for them or it's really bad for their their future health so we i care a lot about air quality that's my my personal uh skin in the game here and um uh, if we have that personalized information then when when the user asks the question for me will the air quality be okay for me then if the air quality if the pm 2.5 which is a measure of air quality is you know over 50 but less than 100 it might be okay for somebody who's who's very healthy has no no problems but not good for somebody who's sensitive so that personalization of the language model it's not something you would do with a, a vector database which only allows maybe similarity search uh, queries it's a point query or a primary key lookup you're going to take the user identity and you're going to look up then uh, whether that user is is uh, 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 sensitive to air, air quality that's poor or not. Okay, and then we're going to finally then come back and, and we'll get an answer from our, our application. The air quality in Stockholm for the coming weeks is going to be great for you. It might need to answer Stockholm, but it might just say the air quality is going to be great for you. Fine. So that's what we want to get to. Now, the um, this is the high level view of the application, but if we go into a little bit more detail, I'm going to walk through uh, how we build this thing, right? So it is a Gradio application. Let's go back and have a look at where we were here. You know, um, let's say, uh, what's the air quality going to be like this coming weekend? Press submit. Um, so when I'm, when, I'm, when I'm making this call here, this is using Hermes. This is running inside a, a Hopsworks cluster, running internal in, in the system. Um, so it's it's saying, yeah, based on it's going to be for March tomorrow, 29th tomorrow. It's actually pulling in my audio one here. So you can see I, I recorded one earlier. So it pulled in that one. But if we if we look at it again, it should ask the, the text based one now. But the um, what it's doing is it's it's taking the query that comes in here it's going to make function calls on external systems. So you can see here, based on the air quality measurements, the air quality for this coming weekend, March 30 and 31st, is going to be moderate to high range. Well, that's interesting. Okay, so for unhealthy, it's unhealthy for sensitive groups. Good news is I'm getting out of town, so that's good for my boys. Um, but you know, uh, um, it, it, that's that's really nice. You know, it's a nicer nice way to interact with an application uh, compared to maybe looking at a graph, which is hard for some people to interpret. So we're going to walk through what happens here. So I, I made the query. It made function calls to, in this case, the model, because it wanted to get a forecast. And then it integrated that back. And it took the result of that, that call to the model, which gave me back these air quality measurements. And it interpreted it and wrote out an interpreted uh, re uh, response. So this response is it, the model actually saying in human language terms what PM 2.5 measurements mean. Um, OK, so let's go through that. There's quite a few steps involved. And we'll start with, uh, we have an application here. So this is a Python application. All of the code is here in this URL here. I'll paste it in the chat if anyone wants to have a look. Um, let's go to the chat here. You can go ahead and, and browse the code at, at your leisure there. So what we're going to start with is the user query comes in. And we need to augment that, that query with the function descriptions. Now, currently, um, for function calling, there's no really great frameworks, I would say, for taking for example, a database schema or uh, an existing code base and wrapping the function descriptions. We're going to do it by hand. Um, over time, there will become much better tooling available. We're working on that internally ourselves. Um, but we'll see that um, there is a little bit of work to do there. And then we're going to uh, generate the function parameters by calling the LLM, and it will return a JSON with the function based on, on this query that we asked here with the parameters filled in. So we'll look at what those functions are. Those functions are basically get future air quality for a particular date or get future air quality for a date range. So they're the future ones, they're gonna to go to the model. And the other historical questions are get air quality for a specific date or get air quality for a range of dates. So they're the functions I'm gonna expose and the model will give me back the function that it thinks should be uh, invoked with the correct parameters. And then we have some code which will execute that function um, on the model or on the feature store. So the model for future data, future queries, the, the weather, the air quality forecast. <laughs> and for historical queries, it'll go to the feature store. <clears throat> Excuse me. The response will then get passed back to the model again. 
along with the original query. So we'll have our original query up here about will the air quality for the coming week be okay? But now it will know information which we'll put into the prompt. It will know that, for example, the air quality for this weekend, the PM 2.5 levels will be 40 and 55. And then it'll say, will the air quality for the coming week be okay? And the model has enough context and information to know whether it'll be good or not. It will give you then this human interpretable uh, answer here. Okay, so that's what we're going to go through. So let's start and look at the code. And we're going to start at the end. That's kind of where you do rather than the beginning. Um, you can run this code um, if you want on your laptop. So I've been running it here on my laptop. And if you're running it on your laptop, um, you can see here I'm using OpenAI. So I put in an OpenAI key here, and I can ask my query here, how's your quality today? It gives me an answer, and I press submit. Um, that's reasonable if you want to try this out on your laptop. If you want to try this out with the uh, Hermes or the open source foundation model, you need a GPU. So I've been running this one here um, on Hopsworks. So this is the, the sorry, this is our same notebook here. Um, and this is the Gradio application here with our user interface. Uh, you can open up in I opened it up on a, on a separate tab. You can make it a little bit nicer and easier to read than inside your notebook. Um, but this, this Gradio application here, it needs a GPU because it's running the, the model internally. Now you can also host that model on a network endpoint and call it, and then you won't need a GPU. But if you're going to use the GPU uh, internally, um, you need to have infrastructure for that. That's the only thing to be aware of. Okay, so um, with that in mind, let's start and let's have a look. So um, this particular notebook is called Function Calling. And you can see if we go to the very top, I'm going to skip through some of the parts of the top because it's not super interesting. And um, we have a couple of um, uh, functions here that they're in a, a, a mod. There's a module called functions with some, uh, there's several modules, sorry, in a package called functions in this uh, repository. Uh, we've one called L LLM chain. And uh, there's another one we'll see later on called about the context. It's going to get the context for our prompts. But what we need to do to begin with is we're going to uh, connect to the Hopsworks platform. And we have uh, references to our historical data there. And we also are going to get our model from Hopsworks. So we log in there. We get a reference to something called the feature view for the model. And we're going to get the weather data out as well. Uh, we download our model. This is a Gradio application. So I'm actually going to download the model, yeah. which has already been trained in Hopsworks. Um, and this model is called um, Air Quality XG Boost Model. We can have a quick look at that in Hopsworks so that you get an idea of what it is. So this is the model I trained earlier. Um, we have, for this particular example, we have a feature pipeline which runs every day and downloads the weather forecast and the air quality observations. It writes it to the feature store that we call a feature pipeline. And then we have a training pipeline to train our model and we run that on demand. And the output of the training pipeline is this model here. It's an XG Boost model. You can see um, there's a back test here uh, on some of the historical data. So this is a kind of a hindcast and, and the model's okay, right? It's only feature data. There's no lag there quality features, which would have made it a little bit better. Um, you could have contextual features because sometimes you'll see air quality for a whole city becomes bad at one time. So that's kind of a more macro features needed to capture that. And we can see feature importance, you know, temperature is, is, is probably the, one of the more important features. But that's our model there that we downloaded. So if we go back to our notebook, we've now got our model and we've loaded it up. Great. And I'm going to load my large language model. In this case, I'm downloading. We can run through this as well while we're here. Well, actually, no, this is on my laptop. So because this one would, would load Hermes, we, we would need to run it um, from the platform. So we could go and actually run it from here, from Hopsworks, which is, yes, run Hopsworks here. So if we you know go through this particular notebook here, and I can restart it. We start and clear all outputs. Um, in this case, you know, it needs to connect to Hopsworks and we'll download the model. Um, but this is where if you're running um, you know, uh, on-premise or if you have your own private model and you're not calling a, mod a large language model in the network endpoint, these are pretty big models. So if you look at this particular one here, where we're loading the model and um, we'll see that, if we have a look at the model itself, um, I didn't download it there yet. Sorry, we're going to download it here. Um, yeah, so the model is, it's currently downloading it. It's quite big. It's about nine gigabytes, I think, or 10 gigabytes. It took 12 seconds because it was actually cached on disk. If you're to download that over the internet, it depends on your, uh, your network bandwidth. It can take anything from minutes to hours. So um, it's important to cache it as well. 
<clears throat> so at this point, we've now downloaded the model and um, we can initialize. We're going to use Langchain as a way to, to invoke the model. So um, this is the, the model here. I can see there's a question. I'll take the question at this point. Uh, could you paste a link to notebook in this section, please? For some reason, I can't see the messages in chat. OK, can I type the answer here? Let's have a quick look. There we go. Um, and it's in the answered sections there. You can see it there. So we can ask um, questions. Now, one thing that's really important when you build large language models is what we call evals, so evaluations of your model. I'm not going to go through it in details today, but the evals uh, basically are a way of making sure that you measure the performance of your model. So in traditional machine learning, we had our model back here. Um, let's have a look at it here. Uh, you know, it's our air quality model. We have a model metric. So we have the mean squared error to evaluate the performance of the model, and we have some hind cast. And that gives a really good idea of the performance of the model. However, in large language models, we don't have that luxury. We uh, we know that you know there's a lot of human in the loop. There's uh, obviously uh, some automated ways. You can use a trainer model to, once you have your evals, you can go to GPT-4 or some other good model to basically say, here's what my input was, here was the output. How good do you think this performed? That's an auto way that may have, of handling your evals, but you need you need evals because otherwise it's really hard to do development and uh, and make progress. So let's have a look at that. I'm just taking a random question here. So how is the air? What was the when and what was the minimum air quality in a date range? So you can see it basically went to the feature store and it it downloaded for this range of dates some values and it says um, the minimum was the minimum air quality. Uh, uh, and they're quality of 14. Um, now, this is a little bit, uh, this is where our model is not entirely correct, which is considered unhealthy for sensitive groups. That's not actually entirely true. So what this would mean at this point is I would have to go and fix my prompt and uh, make it a bit more explicit. Maybe we need a, um, you, you have like, a, in this case, uh, when I'm prompting, I might maybe add multiple examples. So a multi-shot prompt to basically say, well, um, and I think we'll have a look at that in a minute, the, the hints we have for the prompting. Okay, so um, so that's that's basically this is the Hermes one. Now, if we went down and we go further down here, you can see I've got the transcription of the audio. We're just using the uh, Whisper model for that. It's very trivial; it's one line of code. Um, and uh, you know, we can see earlier that that we had a choice between using uh, OpenAI. I think that's in this one here. We have the OpenAI one. It's this one here or using Hermes, let's have a look at that code here. So yeah, this is it here. So um, so what we're using is Gradio as a UI. It starts at this particular point and you know you can enter your text or your voice and then it's gonna call a function. And the function it's gonna call here is this one called handle input. So if we jump back up to handle input, that's here. And if it's audio, we're gonna transcribe it, otherwise we'll get text. So ultimately we'll have this user query that we're gonna send to our, our Gradio or to our application to, to predict uh, a response to the air quality query. If it's open AI, it'll, um, uh, you have to check that you have an open AI key. Um, and then we're going to send basically our response to this generate query response, the actual query. And um, the method in here is whether it's open AI or not, and then the open AI key if we need it. So let's dive in here and look at generate query response. So generate query response is in this file here called LLM chain. Generate query. Sorry, I'm in a. Uh, I should have. I should have probably used a, a proper ID instead of um, instead of my notebook. Okay, let's go down here. Generate. So we have generate response. Sorry. So generate response was actually. Let's go back here. So this generate query response actually is up here. And um, generate query response will either call generate response here for Hermes or for um, OpenAI, it'll call generate response OpenAI. So um, let's go ahead and look at OpenAI first, and then we'll look at Hermes afterwards. OK, so we're in here. So let's generate response. So this is our first one, generate response OpenAI. So we have the user query came in here. Now you can see I've passed in not just the user query, but I've passed in some extra context. And this is typically what you would want to do in an application. Hopefully you can see this OK. Um, in an application, there's extra information available. In this case, I have what's called a feature view in Hopsworks. That's the, the set of inputs to my model, the input set of features, plus the, the expected output, the target. Um, I also have this thing called the weather feature group, because I'm going to look up some weather data. 
um, for features uh, as input features to my model when I want to make a prediction. Um, I have this model air quality. If we go back, we'll have a look at what that was. So the model air quality, um, come in here. That's our actual model. That's the model that we read at the very beginning, if you remember. This is our XGBoost model. We also need the actual large language model in Hermes, but in OpenAI, we don't. So um, there's no reference to the OpenAI uh, model there. But what we need, however, is the client in OpenAI. So we're going to connect to OpenAI. We need this client. So um, here we are. We don't, we don't have the large language model. We just have a client to call OpenAI. And what we need to do to, to begin with is we want to get this context data. So we're going to call a method called get context, and it's going to return uh, back uh, the, the response from our functions. And so let's go in and look at that. Get context data. Let's move this thing out of the way. Okay. Okay, here we go. So at get context data here, you can see that we have the user query coming in. We've got this thing, the feature view for data retrieval. Um, the actual large language. Uh, so this is not, so this is slightly off. This is, should be the model air quality. So this is our model for air quality. And um, then we have uh, a tokenizer. So a tokenizer is used to take the input string and uh, convert into tokens. So in large language models, uh, the string that you enter is converted into a smaller number of tokens. So if for you know my 10 input uh, words earlier, we may be going to get 12 or 13 tokens. And those tokens will then be encoded. They'll be converted into integers. And th those integers will be looked up. And they'll be what we call vector embeddings that are fed into the model for those tokens. And that's basically what goes into the model, the large language model. Um, so we can see here, this, this is slightly off this args. As you can tell, this is all very, um, uh, uh, very new and fresh. And it's going to return the context data. So what we're going to do is we're going to basically call function calling with OpenAI with the user query in the client. And um, then we're going to get back something called completion. So this completion will be our JSON. If we go back to our diagram we had here, um, we're going to make this call on OpenAI. And we're going to get back this JSON here. So let's have a look at how that works. So it's going to call function calling with OpenAI. It's this method here. And um, in here, we have the user query and the string. And what we need to do now is build up the prompt. In the prompt, what we're going to do is we're going to pass in the set of functions that are available, and they're going to be part of this instructions here. So you can see we're going to have, uh, <clears throat> we're going to say, here's the user query. Um, we're going to add the functions to it, and we're going to basically extract what we get back as uh so this I am start is it is it in when in our tokenizer recognize it as a, as a um, saying this is the response this is the user part of of the query that I want to get out. So in um, when you have a, a a lang chain or any sort of conversation with OAI, you have uh, with OpenAI APIs, you you have uh, the system part of the prompt, you have the the user part, and you have the assistant part. So this part case, I want the um, the the user part. So let's look at the get function calling prompt we have here. So get function calling prompt, this is where we're encoding our function. So we, every time we want to add a new function, we'll need to add it in here in the way we've currently written this code. So what we have is um, a quick example saying we have this function that will look like this. We'll have a function name, and there'll be arguments or parameters to that function. And each argument will have a name and a value. Um, here's an example. So we're giving a, a single shot example of that function here. And then we have the actual prompt. And this is OpenAI. Like I mentioned, this is the token to indicate um, start. This is part the system part of the prompt. And we're telling the uh, LLM that you're a helpful assistant with access to the following functions. So in this case, serialize function to JSON. This is going to take a reference. This is our function, get historical data for date. That looks like this one here. We get historical data for date. Um, we have imported it into the in, at the beginning of this, uh, you can see it's imported in here. Uh, it's a function. And then we have this serialized function to JSON, which will take our function as a parameter, as you can do in Python. And then we're going to extract the method signature. So we're going to extract the signature of that function, and um, which will give us uh, the name. Um, we can see the description. Um, 
<laughs> and any type ints as well for the and all our parameter information error parameter types. So we can take all that and dump it as a JSON and return it to um, the client. So what we'll get here is then the serialized JSON or the JSON representing these four different functions. And that's going to be part of our prompt. Now we get into the more creative part of, of prompt engineering. You still have to do some prompt engineering to get started with here. And we played around with this a bit and we we you know added some some hints saying um, if the query has the word will, it's going to be a future data function of some sort. sort. Um, if the user says the day of the week, assume that the day of the week, uh, the date of the day of that week um, is when the next is 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 when that day next arrives. So being a little bit more explicit about it, um, and then we want dates back in a particular format, and and then you you know you, you use bold letters to shout at the model, say please do it this way. Um, but also it's important to say well if you can't answer this query if there's no function available just generate a no no function needed string, and um, because you know maybe the user asks something random that isn't related to the function, you don't want to call on the functions anyway. We're injecting the date in here because we can put context in here. We can put any information we want to in, in here in our prompt. And the date is important um, as context information. And then what we want to do is we want the model to return and um, to use one of these functions, respond strictly with this particular format. So we have this. Um, uh, you know, this XML style format that it's going to return with. This is the function we want you to call. And this is a, a multi-shot uh, uh, prompting example. We're giving it several examples here where we don't need functions. Here's where we, we want a function. Um, and uh, this is basically our prompt. So there is a bit of creativity in, in putting this prompt together. Um, but, you know, uh, it's not, not super difficult. So that's our instructions that we get back. We call OpenAI, we get back this messages, and then we're going to basically clean it up and return, extract to return the assistance reply from the response. We don't return the whole response. Um, and then the client uh, basically uh, will be, when we go down further, it'll be able to, it'll get back this completion here. And then what it's going to do, sorry, it's going to call extract function calls. So that's uh, further up in here. Okay. So we have here, so it takes back um, our string, which is the, the JSON for our function. And we're going to extract the function that we want to call. Um, you can see we're calling JSON load on the function text for all of the functions. And um, then we can call those functions. So there's a method here called invoke function. And invoke function will take that JSON and run our functions. So it's going to extract the function name, the arguments, um, all of the attributes. In our case, we also pass in some parameters. So all of our functions have the same si uh, general signature where they have, uh, they take a, a weather view object, a, a, sorry, feature view object, weather view object in our model. And you may have different functions that, that need different sets of parameters. So you might need to uh, have a condition in here to see which one to execute. Um, but basically we need to pass those in here as, as a function as well so that they have access to them when we want to call this function. So that's going to run the function. So that function, um, if we looked at the example earlier uh, that we had here, uh, it basically went out and we, we ran one up here. Um, you can see here that it returned, it said reading data from Hopsworks. So it actually went to the Hopsworks data. This is on Parquet files. It's using um, ArrowFlight and DuckDB to give us super fast data back from our object store. And, um, and we get the data back and then we used it to to, we're going to use that now basically to give the actual answer, which is this particular one here about the minimum air quality. So let's jump back in there. Um, we're back in here. Um, we've got back our um, our completion. Let's have a look here. So we generate, generate response, open AI, and we get back uh, the instructions for our, we get back our prompt, sorry, the functions to call and um, we invoke them, and then finally we invoke this. This is the answer then that we're going to get uh, and send back to the user. So we looked at that already, and then it will come back here. Um, and in Gradio, it will then return that. When we return it from um, this string here, it's what gets printed into the, to the output text box in our UI. So the same basic process is followed for Hermes. Uh, Hermes is the, uh, the, the, the Mistral fine-tuned model. and um, you can see here we call generate Hermes instead. It looks a little bit different because we have a little bit more work to do. We're not going to make just an API call. We're going to take in the query um, 
and the model and the tokenizer. And then we're going to get the function calling prompt. So we don't need to go uh, through that, but it's basically going to do something similar. It's going to build up this prompt. And then we're going to tokenize that. And uh, because we're running on a GPU here, we're going to use Torch. Um, and we're going to call model.llm.generate. So this is actually invoking the model here within our application. And um, then we get the response. We're going to decode that, the tokens that we get back as a response. And then th those to that response is now a stringified output. And um, this is our completion. And then when we, 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 we again, because Hermes and OpenAI have the same uh, schema for function calling, we can use uh, the same basic idea. And, and we call uh, get back the functions from, from that completion. And then we can invoke those functions. And then this is the same code for OpenAI and Hermes. Um, and then finally, uh, um, you know, we, we're going to then uh, return the, the response from the model about that data. So what they actually thought about it. So that's kind of the whole flow of the, the application. We can see it. Um, you know, if we if we take a, a step back, if you want to follow this particular tutorial, there's instructions here. You can go to the GitHub and, and you can um, fork it and, and go ahead and play with it. Uh, you will need an account on Hopsworks. So you will need a uh, to create an account on Hopsworks.ai. It's free, uh, forever free. You get about 35 gigabytes of free storage there. Um, and, you know, this is not designed to run on um, Colab notebooks. You'll need Jupyter or VS Code or something because we put this uh, functionality, which is used by um, some of the notebooks in these modules. So it's going to import these modules. So if you open these notebooks in in um, in Colab, it won't be able to import these notebooks. You can hack it around if you want to, but, but you know, um, I prefer to do it this way. I will say as well that the Hermes example, I tried to run it on Colab, it's too big. So the T4s that you get for free are too big and um, the model won't load. I, I'm running this on A100 GPUs on Hopsworks um, and that's kind of where we're going. We have a question at this point from Christoph Ravi. How does using many functions scale with prompt context length? And um, won't the LM be prone to make mistakes the more functions and stuff we put in the prompt? The answer, of course, to that question is yes. And the context window size of our LM is, of course, very important. So we all know that context window sizes are increasing. You know, the latest um, uh, from Google have, you know, context window size of a million bytes, but that's not the norm. So, you know, 32K, I think, is, is a pretty standard size. You can fit a lot of functions into that. Um, I think, you know, th this model is very appropriate for... Uh, enterprise specific tasks you know so this is not at the moment in, in a in a state where you would say this is going to build my application that asks everything about anything and this is more i have specific task i know there's about you know five to fifty functions that make up my my system and i can fit them in here and uh, i can build a really focused task that will that will do this for me so great question um and, you know, I think the more functions you add, I think like, so the key point to the question is as you add more and more functions, will it make a mistake and call the wrong functions? That's very controllable. So, let, so let's actually take one one last thing we'll, I'll do to finish off is um, I'm going to look at, let's say we, we took this example that we looked at here and we said, um, you know, what I'd really like is I'd like to also personalize this. You know, I want to to um to have it in such a way that that it, it knows about me what the air quality would be like for me so in in the example here i had this point i said um are you in a sensitive group coming soon so imagine that data is available right we imagine that data i have it in a postgres or a mysql database somewhere so let's assume it's in a mysql database so i had a look at this earlier so what we can do in hopsworks is we can take a storage connector to your JDBC table. So you can you know, put in your JDBC connection here and your credentials and set up a storage connector. Um, so I did one already, and this is a, a user's table. in um, It's in a MySQL database. And what we can do is we can um, mount that database directly as what we call a feature group in Hopsworks. So a feature group, an external feature group, I should say. So we have this thing called external feature group. That means that the data is kept in your database. It never moves into Hopsworks. And you can say it's like, so air quality uh, users. Um, and this is where function call it, it's important. Um, and where tables in existing databases are somewhat limited. You need the metadata. So you need metadata about, so we need, maybe my existing table's name is not very good. It's something like, you know, um, you know, uh, uh, 
personal info or something like that. That's not going to help the model interpret it. So I should give it a really good name. So, um, you know, user, uh, let's call it um, uh, air quality uh, or uh, sensitivity, sensitivity, activity for users, right? And then you can have a long description about that, what that means. Um, you might, in our case, we probably won't need to make it available online. That means at low latency. You can explicitly add the features or you can basically then, um, you pick the connector or you can just have a SQL query and say, I'll just select all of the columns from my table. And then you can go ahead and create the feature group. And you can add those features if you like, if you like and put in a feature description in here. So this is the metadata that we'll need for our um, model to work. So I actually created this one earlier. I didn't give it a great name, users. Um, but basically, um, what we can see here is that I can fill in you know, this metadata description. Um, we also have statistics that we can compute over it so that we can use those and feed them into the model. This is the metadata that you need to enable your model to be able to, to, to decide the correct function to, to run. We have another question here. OK, it's the same one again. Um, one in the chat. OK, we have a link to the to the reference for that. OK, so that gives you an idea and a feel of, of, of how you can move ahead with these things. If you're interested um, in, in, in talking to us at Hopsworks about you know, how to build large language models with function calling or with traditional RAG, next week I'm going to talk about RAG. So these feature groups that we have in Hopsworks here, these are tables of data where you can have columns that are uh, vector embeddings, and we support then similarity search of those columns. So you have your tabular data here, but we get the vector uh, database style similarity search queries on them. You don't, basically, you don't need to have a separate vector database. You can just store, store it all in here. And you have one place then for your RAG for function calling, uh, vector databases, and even uh, models, as we talked about earlier. Thanks everyone for listening. Um, that's the end of the first session of the LLM Makers uh, video series at Hopsworks. Um, if you want to learn more, go to the repo, um, try it out, give us some feedback. Uh, we have a, a public Slack where you can ask questions uh, on. And uh, if you're interested more, you can go ahead and read this book that we, I mentioned earlier. So you go ahead and download the first chapter for free. It's it's currently being written, and and this example is is. Is, is ending up in the book. So, um, you know, this is very early access. And um, thanks a million for listening and uh, have a great rest of your day.